Welcome back to our Hebrew study that we've been going through this summer. We're now on the seventh session of this teaching, and I really commend you if you continued on, because some of this has been a lot of digging into the Old Testament, a lot of holding it in one hand and, and the book of Hebrews in another. And, and I hope that by doing so, this book has really opened up to you. There's, a, there's so much packed in the book of Hebrews, so much theology and teaching that is predicated on the Old Testament, on the sacrificial system, on the Old Covenant, on the priesthood, on the understanding of the messengers of God and the prophets. And by studying those things, we have a greater picture of Jesus's character and his divinity and his role in our salvation. And today we continue and we see the application. So if Remember, talking about the chiasm, in the last two sessions, we spent really hitting the main thrust of the book, talking about the order of Melchizedek and Jesus as high priest in that order and the atoning sacrifice in that order. So now we move out of that. And remember, we come to this word. Anytime we see therefore, what's it there for? Well, it's therefore in this case because Jesus is our high priest and our atoning Sacrifice, meaning he is the covering of our sin. He takes the penalty of our sin upon himself, covers us with his righteousness. Therefore, since he is acting as the perfect high priest and atoning sacrifice, therefore, we have entered, we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Christ. Now, this is has a, a twofold meaning here. First of all, it means that we have boldness to say that the Spirit of God has entered into us, that we are the tabernacle. Our, our being, the Spirit of God, dwells within us. It doesn't sit in the most holy place of the temple where the Ark of the Covenant was. It rests within us. It rests in our hearts. The Spirit of God resides within us through the atoning blood of Jesus. But then secondly, it's also a promise that we will enter into the throne room of God. We will enter into the presence of God, into the tabernacle of God, the eternal tabernacle of God. And so here we begin to see, and, and we'll see this more fully as the book comes to a close, but we see what's called inaugurated eschatology. Inaugurated eschatology is an eschatolo eschatological framework. So remember, anytime we come to ology, it's the study of eschatos the end times. So the study of the end times. Inaugurated eschatology means it's an eschatology that is built on the framework of already, but, not that kind of but, but not yet. So inaugurated eschatology means that the kingdom of God has already been inaugurated, that we're already a part of God's kingdom, and yet it's not yet fully here. So we are already the dwelling place of God. Our hearts as believers, he already rests within us. The community of Christians, the church, is already part of the kingdom of God. We're ambassadors of that kingdom. And so that's the type of language that Paul uses when he says that we, we have a kingdom of God that we're awaiting in eternity, and we are leaving, or we are taking that kingdom into another kingdom. So an ambassador of a foreign country, they'll go into another country and they have a residence in that country, but they have an embassy in which that embassy bears the authority of the country of their origin, of the country that they're an ambassador from. It's the same with us as Christians. We are of the kingdom of God and we have already established that kingdom in the form of an embassy of this world, but we're returning to that kingdom. We have not yet made it to the fullness of that kingdom, of that presence of God, but we are promised that it's coming because of the blood of Jesus. And through the blood of Jesus, then, we have the boldness to say, God is present within us. God is present in the church. God is here as we worship. God has covered us through Jesus' blood. And the promises of God will be fulfilled, and we will be in his sanctuary, in his presence for all of eternity. Now, we can think of this, therefore, it's a conjunction, which means that it's conjoining a previous thought and making a statement based off of that thought. 
But the author of Hebrews, the teacher, he uses a series of conjunctions or a series of imperatives following this therefore that builds off of the teaching here. So he's saying, therefore, since Jesus is our high priest in atonement, we have boldness to enter into the dwelling of God both here and now. So then, he says, let us draw near with a true heart and full, full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good work. So what we see here is we see three applications based on the conjunction of the therefore. So therefore, since we have boldness to enter into the presence of God through Jesus' sacrifice, let us draw near to him with a full assurance of our faith. So let us be confident in what Christ has done. Let us hold our righteousness in accordance with our faith. And this is something Paul talks about so often and in, in primarily in the book of Romans, where he says it is by faith that we are declared righteous, that, that it's not by works, but by faith in what has been done for us that we're declared righteous. And, and the author of Hebrews is following in that line of thinking and saying, let us hold fast, let us hold full assurance of faith that our hearts are sprinkled clean, that we are declared righteous. And then let us hold on to our confession of our hope without wavering. So let us hold on to this confession. Let us have faith in what has been done and let us hold on to the confession of that faith. Let us remember constantly what was done, what Jesus did, the works of our high priest as our atoning sacrifice. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. I like to say that as a Christian, it is impossible or next to impossible to remain a Christian in isolation because there are so many commands, so many uh, exhortations within the New Testament for us to live life together, to join together, to be the community of God together, to be the kingdom already in anticipation of the kingdom not yet. And this is another example of that. Let us continue to consider one another, to provoke one another, to join together, to love, to, to do good works together, not neglecting gathering together, not neglecting our fellowship. And what this means is, is, at this point, the fact that the author says, as some are in the habit of doing, is we're quickly starting to see that there were some that were taking what Jesus had done as a high priest and reverting back to that nominal Israelite mindset. Because remember, I alluded to this a few sessions ago, talking about how there were some Israelites who would come and do their obligations of bringing a sacrifice, finding the right animal, you know, paying their tithe, doing all the right things. But when push came to shove, they were they truly loving God? Were they truly following the, the pinnacle of the law of love God, love others, serving Him, honoring Him, giving their life to Him? Probably not. And quickly on in the early church, the, the author of Hebrews, he's exhorting us not to fall back into that mentality, not to get to this point where we become nominal. And that word nominal, it just means in name only. We call ourselves Christians, but are we living out that faith? Are we holding on to that faith? Is that faith our identity? Is that faith what binds us together as we're living out what it means to be the kingdom of God already in anticipation of the not yet? He's encouraging us to ensure we do not neglect that. As some, even in the first century, were already in the habit of doing. Now ask yourself, do you see some in the 21st century, some Christians in the 21st century, do you see yourself in the habit of neglecting some of these let us statements? Because I think it's pretty easy to do so. It's pretty easy to doubt. And I'm not saying it's a sin to doubt or it's wrong to doubt. I'm saying that sometimes we have a tendency to try to take matters into our own hands. To say, well, I've got to sprinkle myself clean. Well, no, we have to hold fast to our faith that he has done. It. He is sufficient. We have to hold faith, hold fast to our confession that he is Lord. He is king. And we have to hold fast to one another, to cling 
to one another, not neglecting one another. And, and he says all of this about how we live out in the already because it's an anticipation of the not yet. So he says, so don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you, will, you need endurance so that after you have done God's will, you may receive what was promised. And then he has this quote here, for yet in a little while, the coming one will come and not delay, but my righteous one, my righteous one will live by faith. And if he draws back, I have no pleasure in him. So this is a quote talking about those who are not remaining in the faith, those who are not are, are living out by that nominal name only, that they never fully jumped into the family of God. And he's saying that those who are nominal only, who are in name only, who are not driving into that faith, those who draw back, he has no pleasure in that. And and the book of Revelations and the when when uh, Revelation in the book of Revelation when Jesus is uh, writing the letter giving the statement to the church of Laodicea he calls them lukewarm Christians which is another way of saying nominal Christians and what does he say about them he says I will vomit you out of my mouth I will expel you from my body and that's what the author of Hebrews is alluding to here those of us those Christians who are in name only, we're drawing back from our faith. We're not living out our faith. We'll say we're a Christian when it's acceptable, but when push comes to shove, we're not in the habit of being that, of engaging in our faith. And so he's encouraging us to remain steadfast, to remain in our faith, to endure, even in hardship and persecution, because that was the precursor to, to, to this section here in verses 35 and 38, was that there were many believers facing persecution, many believers facing hardship. Now ask yourself this, if you were being persecuted for what you believed, if you were facing uh, destruction, if you were facing all sorts of things that were pulling you away from your faith, would you relinquish that faith in order to not have to face those persecutions or would you grip tightly that faith he's enduring christians amidst these persecutions i would dare say that there are many christians in america today who are struggling to endure in their faith that are taking on this label of lukewarm christians without even being pulled away from it other than being chasing the things of the world so I want to. I hope that you've you've read the passage for this this week, Hebrews ten nineteen through thirty nine. But I'd also encourage you to read through Galatians five sixteen through twenty five, and this is the passage of Paul where he talks about the fruits of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, and he compares that. Sometimes we often miss it to the fruit of the world, to the flesh of the world, and it's this dichotomy relationship that he's not saying that the physical body is bad and the soul is good. That's actually Plato. So anytime you've heard someone say that the body is bad and only the spirit is good, they're quoting Plato, they're not quoting Paul or, or the New Testament. What Paul is identifying is that the things of the world that pull us from God are obvious. And there are so many things in this world today that are pulling a Christian. We're not persecuted in America in the same way that the early church was persecuted, but we are pulled from our faith so much more prevalently maybe. And there are so many things of the world that are obvious that we lean into. And in that section in Galatians 5, 16 through 25, he's encouraging us to remain in the fruit that only the Spirit offers. To remain diligent in the fruit. To endure in our faith. To stay steadfast in our faith. And the author of Hebrews is saying the same thing. Remain in our faith. Remain in the Spirit. Remain in the presence of God that is already here and now as we anticipate and long for the fullness of that presence that is coming in eternity as we dwell in the throne room of God. And I hope you are anticipating that, that you're excited for that. And I hope that this study has opened your eyes to some of the amazing truths of Scripture in promising the rest in the eternity in God's presence that's coming our way. And I hope you continue joining us in this study and that you'll continue to pick up. Next week we are going to be looking through what is often called, referred to as the Hall of Faith, heroes of the faith from the Old Testament, and that would be Hebrews chapter 11, 
um, which is all 40 verses of that chapter. And so if you have time, read before our teaching next week. But I, I hope you are encouraged by all these studies into the, the book of Hebrews. And we'll see you next time as we continue in this series. Mm-hmm.